Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us for Reporters Plus. In this edition, we take you to Rwanda, which in 1994 was the site of an unthinkable massacre. More than 800,000 Rwandans, many Tutsis, were slaughtered by the Hutu majority. In the face of that genocide, there were some Hutus who tried to intervene and were executed because of it. But others lived to tell the tale. In this report, we focus on those men and women who risked their lives in one of history's darkest hours. Our report from Luc Lagamboucher. It's difficult to imagine these lush, fertile hills as the scene of unthinkable violence. But their seemingly peaceful inhabitants were also swept up in the wave of mass murder that engulfed Rwanda in 1994. Very few of them opposed it. People are being cut, chopped and mutilated. Corpses litter the floor. On the streets, you can see convulsing bodies of people who haven't been finished off. It's quite simply a butcher shop, a slaughterhouse. In just three months, more than 800,000 Rwandans, mostly of Tutsi ethnicity, were exterminated by the Hutu majority. The few Hutus who did try to resist were executed. Still, there were some who would not go along with the killing. Among them were fraudulent a farmer. It was like sacrificing yourself by entering a burning house to save someone from the flames. Damas, the director of an orphanage. Even if you were just hiding someone, even just a Tutsi baby, they would kill you and your family and Josephine, a bar owner. I could see that the people they were killing were human beings, innocent people. I chose to help them with the strength of God. And if they caught me with them, we would go together. What did it take to make this choice? Why did they do it? This is the story of three of Rwanda's so-called righteous, and of those they saved. Thomas is a survivor of the genocide. At the time, I was 10 years old, and like everyone around me, I was afraid. In April 1994, this young Tutsi came to spend the holidays on his uncle's farm in Kibuyi, on the shores of Lake Kivu. When the first killing started, the local prefect asked Tutsis to assemble in designated places, supposedly to guarantee their safety. People took refuge in the church, especially Christians like my uncle's family. They said to themselves, we may as well die in the house of God. Others went to the stadium just as the authorities had encouraged them to do in order to protect them. But in reality, it was just a ruse to get them together and annihilate them more quickly using heavy weapons. The prefect had in fact ordered soldiers, militiamen, and ordinary citizens to assassinate the Tutsis. Josephine is a Hutu. This married bar owner and mother of seven children was present at the massacre of more than 10,000 Tutsis.
We heard the crackle of weapons coming from the stadium just behind us. The screams could be heard ringing all around us. They massacred a lot of people at the stadium. Then they went to the church to kill people there. Those who were able to escape ran away and hid in the bush. They were hunted down and killed there. Others made it to the lake. The killers were enthusiastic, motivated. It was as if they'd found something good in killing. They were well equipped for it. They were ready for anything. They were no longer men. They'd become hyenas. Thomas's uncle and family gathered in the church were all killed. But the young boy, who had stayed back on the farm, escaped the carnage. He hid in order to avoid the gangs of killers who were hunting down survivors. I slept there among those shrubs. I was looking for the best place. I thought if I went to that big bush up there, I would have a better chance of surviving if only for one more day. I walked around this whole area that you see here. I was completely desperate. He was in a bad shape. It was difficult to recognize that he was a human being. His eyes looked broken. He was completely disorientated. His clothes were ragged. In short, it wasn't a pretty sight. I said to him, come over here. If people see you, they'll kill you. Get out of there and come with me. A lady came out of her house and saw me up there. She called to me and I thought, I've got nothing more to lose. Even if I risk dying, I might as well go. In life, you have to take risks. What happened next could have led to life or to death. I decided to follow her. It was a very serious crime. If you were found to be hiding a Tutsi, you'd be ordered to kill them, and then you'd be killed. We were warned. It was like a law. It was known to everyone. It had to be explained to all the farmers. That's why a lot of people didn't dare to hide their friends, because it was an impossible task. It was like a sacrifice. Josephine, like all Rwandans, grew up surrounded by anti-Tutsi government propaganda. At school, on the radio, in the newspapers, the message was continuous. One day, they would have to get rid of the Tutsi. The latter were labeled cockroaches, or inyenzi in the Rwandan language. Dear listeners, hello. You are listening to RTLM. We are approaching a day where we will be able to say there is not a single inyenzi left in the country. This will only be possible if we continue our drive to exterminate them. Pierre is a Tutsi. He knew that he had become hunted. So he sought refuge in his office at the Kibuyi Forestry Office, hoping the militiamen would not dare to come and kill him there, since the organization was Swiss-run. I heard people breaking doors up in the offices of uh, Batimasivir, where my friend, my best friend, was hiding with his family. So they broke the doors, they took them off, and they killed them. So I was very much disturbed, somehow losing my mind. So I decided to go out. That is when I went up, and uh, after that, I met Josephine. She was a neighbor 
not very friend. I knew she was a Hutu. I found Pierre looking haggard, and I said to him, Pierre, what are you doing here? You know very well what's happening. I know that you're a Tutsi. He replied, I don't have any choice. I don't know where to go. So I said to him, come to my house, pass by the corn and bean fields. The way she looked at me gave me hope. Pierre took refuge in her house. Twelve people in total would later shelter at her home for a few days, never more. The militiamen were constantly searching houses. I didn't go looking for them to save them. They were the ones who came to me. They came out of the forest. They were moving around without being seen. How could I have left them outside? Impossible. It was a force that came from God, nothing else. I could see that the people they were killing were human beings, innocent people. I chose to help them with the strength of God. And if they caught me with them, we would go together. Josephine helped every Tutsi who crossed her path. Others tempted fate even further by going out to find Tutsis to save. Around 50 kilometers east of Kibuyi is Shiogwe, a typical village in the Rwandan countryside set into a landscape of hills and fields. Frodjuld is a modest farmer. When they killed, they were happy. They bragged about killing people. They were proud of it. They would talk about it openly. There was no remorse. There were even some who forced a man to have sex with his wife in public. Then they cut off their heads. And nobody could stop it? It was like sacrificing yourself by entering a burning house to save someone from the flames. Like many Tutsis, Antoinette fled to her home village to find protection with her family and friends. But the genocide had also reached Shiogwe. We left home quickly. We didn't even close it up. We just left like that. There was an atmosphere of fear. We wondered what would happen to us. Everybody could see death coming for them. Antoinette fled to the Anglican parish. And that was precisely where Frodjuld came searching for Tutsis to save. No. To do that, this Hutu used all his experience from working on the farm. The idea for a trench came to me while listening to the radio. I heard that soldiers were digging trenches and living in them. So why not use something underground to save people? So I dug a large hole, like a house, with a little opening to get inside. I covered it with branches and soil, then grew crops on top of it. This is how Frodjuld hid 19 people. It was there. We were all together, boys and girls and women. It was very cramped. We were packed in right to the entrance. Whenever we wanted to change around or to get to the side, we would count one, two, three, and then everybody would do it at the same time. We spent days like that. It rained, water was coming in, 
We put our hands out like that to catch water to drink. Then we drank. They would go into the holes between 3 and 4 a.m. and only come out at night, except when there were militiamen in the area. Froduel preferred to put us close to the path, so it would be less suspicious. We didn't make any noise. We talked very, very softly. We knew that if they ever came one day or if they knew where we were, we'd be finished. God alone protected us. We were without hope. In Xiogui, Froduald had two weeks to think before the killing started. But in Kigali, the genocide started overnight, on the 6th of April. Tutsis were looking to hide by the thousands. But where could they go? This orphanage housed 65 children at the time. Its director, Damas Kizimba, a Hutu, had to cope with an influx of dozens of Tutsi families. They were all hoping that the militiamen would not dare kill people in his orphanage. At first, they sent their children to me. I couldn't refuse the children. After that, it got very difficult. The adults started coming too. I couldn't send them away because I already had their children. How could I tell a mother, don't come in, leave, but then save her child? And on top of that, they were running from certain death. Damas immediately separated the adults from the children. He put the youngest with the orphans. The children were with the others in the dormitories, but I hid the parents here. It's an infirmary. We put them in there, which was a toilet. So there were five people here. They were all standing, pressed tightly together. We put the door like this, then we put that over it. And that hid the door. The militiamen didn't know people were inside, and when they saw it was open here, and nothing was stopping them from going in and inspecting what they wanted, they just looked and thought it was fine. In 1994, P. Magabo was a young politician. As a Tutsi, as well as the co-founder of an opposition party, he was at the top of the list of those to be killed. <laughs> he too fled to the orphanage with his wife and children. <laughs> Frankly, I didn't think that I would survive. Why? Every day we got new information. This person was dead, this person had been killed, this person had been killed. Imagine spending almost three months in a toilet. We had to speak very softly. We had to avoid looking out of the window. It was a very stressful situation. At night, they came out to eat something, stretch their legs a bit and talk. But I had to inspect the place first to see if it was calm, because the militiamen could be lurking anywhere. Over the three months of genocide, militiamen supported by the population spread terror across the capital, even right in front of the orphanage. There was a military checkpoint here, so this is where the militia was stopping everybody. They asked to see identity cards. Inside was marked what ethnicity you were, and if you were Tutsi, they took you to the mass grave over there, they killed you right there and threw you in. At first, Damas won favor with militia leaders with money and food. When he had nothing more to offer, 
the militiamen started to become suspicious and he tried to reason with them. They were looking for Tutsis. I explained to them, listen carefully, these are my orphan children, and I think that among these children there could even be yours, because I don't know how to distinguish a Hutu or Tutsi child. If you kill the children and tomorrow you find out there were your cousins among the children, wouldn't you feel remorse? So actually the children protected the adults. But for this strategy to work, Damas had to make the Tutsi children believe their parents had gone to hide somewhere else. The children didn't know the adults were here, because a child is a child, they're innocent. A militiaman could ask them a question, you're here but where are your parents? A child would just say, they're here. So you see, we had to hide the whereabouts of their parents from the children. We hadn't seen our children for months, so we made a little hole. And we tried to see them from the hole to see how the children were. Oh, it was something terrible. Excuse me, when I talk about this, I have a lot of emotion. Oh, it was terrible. God will reward him for his good deeds. Hiding, telling lies, playing tricks. It took any means to save a life. The Entarama Memorial, not far from Kigali, was built to remember the 5,000 Tutsi who were massacred in the local church. Professor Kaishima is pausing for a moment in front of the wall of the names of the victims. In 2009, he organized the only university study on the righteous to date. Only 270 of them are included, and due to a lack of resources, it covers only a tenth of the Rwandan territory. We could not find a term in French to refer to these people who had rescued others. We borrowed this term, the righteous, from the last world war when Jewish people survived thanks to help from non-Jews. Those people were called the righteous among the nations. It's perhaps sad to say that the righteous are mostly simple people, rural people with a low level of education. That's the typical profile. We find few of them among the intellectuals, those who went on to further education. These are people who don't stand out much from their neighbors, but made a choice at a crucial moment that represented an enormous risk. These people acted against the collective madness. They represent a role model for humanity. In 1994, Frodjuald, the farmer who hid Tutsis in a ditch, was father to five children, and his wife was pregnant with the sixth. One day, three soldiers came here and were suspicious of me. They searched the whole house. Obviously, they couldn't find anyone because the people were in the holes. When they took me outside, I thought they were going to kill me. 
But they talked, and one of them said, we've searched everywhere but found nothing. Do you really think this guy here could hide people and also feed them? Then they let me go. It was a personal sacrifice. It's difficult to explain why I did that. Sometimes I would go and be alone to think about what would happen if they caught me. I told myself, right, if they catch me, I'm going to die with these people. But they are humans like me, so I was ready to die with them. Sebugiganda, the son of Butete, who lives in Kilau, and Lawrence, the wife of Gakanyeri in Sandero Barrere, and also the young guys from the Guitare sector, more precisely in the hamlet of Rusitsi. Names of people to be killed were broadcast across the whole country. The initial wave of killings had become a manhunt. On the shores of Lake Kivu, most Tutsis lived in the Kibuyi region. The Hutu population, fired with bloodlust, stalked them relentlessly. For Josephine, the bar owner, keeping fugitives at home no longer became viable. The Tutsis almost had no chance of getting out of this. They not only had the military, but also ordinary people after them. Everyone was convinced that the Tutsis were their personal enemy, so how could they escape? In Rwanda, there was nowhere to hide, so I stole a boat to take them to the island of Ijwi. Over there, they were safe. Kibuye is located on the Rwandan side of Lake Kivu. 40 kilometers away, in the middle of the lake, lies the island of Ijwi, belonging to the Democratic Republic of Congo. Reaching there meant escaping the genocide. Pierre, the forestry office worker, was the first to make this perilous crossing in a rowboat. We left this place around 8 p.m. You see, this place of Ijwi, it is the nearest. But there is uh, that island. That island is, it is uh, on the Rwanda side, and there are a lot of militias. So we took this side, and we reached Congo, Ijwi. This is how I think, because it was 4.45. Everybody loves his life. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy because I'm alive. But on the other side, mm, I feel hurt. I feel sorry for those who lost their lives for no reason. It's like what I say. And sometimes it is, uh, it comes difficult to to narrate this story. Yes. The escape plan had worked. From that point on, Josephine tried to procure new boats. Thanks to her resourcefulness, 10 other people like Pierre managed to reach the island of Ijwi. But for Thomas, 10 years old at the time, it was impossible to make the crossing alone at night, rowing for nearly 10 hours. So Josephine took him to her family's village, a little further along the shores of the lake. I felt safe with Josephine, but only in her house. 
Seeing the situation outside, it was probably better to go there than staying. He was a child and did what he was told. I told him, nobody will kill you as long as we're together. And if we see someone, it's up to me to explain. But I told myself as well, if they understood that we were running away, they would kill us. I was very afraid, but I didn't have a choice. She said to me, I will take you to my family. They're good. You won't have to hide. And you could even play with the other children at the house. I told them, this child has a Tutsi father and a Hutu mother. I've already saved some others who left by boat. I'm trusting you with this child, but I will come and get him later. Because the rest of his family had been killed, they agreed to look after him. I am so proud of my daughter. So proud. My little sister was there too. I told her, let him play. Look after the cows, because they don't know him here. Never leave him alone, and don't hide him. I thank them from the bottom of my heart. May they be blessed for all they have done. May they pass this courage on to their children, so that they can carry this example into the future. Once back home, Josephine continued her mission to save people. It brought her close to death. In the final days of the genocide, a woman and her baby came to her home for help. But a policeman spotted them and followed. He said to the woman, hey you, come here. She got up. She carried her child like this. He told her to come over to the side. I went down onto the ground, face down. I couldn't think straight. I already thought I was dead. Then I heard gunshots, two or three, no more. The woman said, I've been hit. Then she didn't say anything else. It was over for them. Josephine said she didn't know anything about the woman. He believed her and spared her. In Kigali, Damas, the director of the orphanage, also experienced moments of extreme danger. There were eight people in the kitchen ceiling. One of them came out to relieve himself. They saw him and caught him. They immediately went into the kitchen to the ceiling. They took everyone out who was there. Among the eight was P's nephew, who knew very well that his wife was in the big house and that his uncle and children were here. But he knew it was over. They tortured them until the early morning, but they didn't say anything. They were our martyrs. Because if they had talked, it would have been everybody. So that's when I realized I needed to get help. Salvation came from powerful international figures. Informed about the risk of carnage at the orphanage, they put pressure on the government to stop the bloodshed. A 
few days later, the massacres ended. I saved 325 children and 80 adults. Altogether, that was 405 people. People trusted me. They came to me. I couldn't be a coward and just say, no, no, don't come to someone who needed help. That would be to send them back into the jaws of the wolves. It would not be human. I even told myself that I would not escape because death was everywhere. And I told myself, if tomorrow was my time, what would I say to God? Better to die as a man than a coward and abandon all these people in danger. In Kigali, Damas had saved hundreds of Tutsis. In Cheogwe, thanks to his trenches, Frodjuald had saved the lives of 19 people. And in Kibuye, Josephine helped 11 Tutsis escape to the Democratic Republic of Congo by boat, as well as keeping young Thomas safe. <laughs> Finding the strength to resist came from different sources for the righteous. For Damas, it was an almost ancestral duty. His grandfather founded the orphanage and his son carried the torch, raising Damas with the message to always protect the most vulnerable. I only thought of saving everyone who came running to me. For me, it was thanks to the education given to me by my parents. They always taught me love. They taught me to love others as much as yourself. Josephine is deeply religious, but also followed her mother's example. Twenty years earlier, her mother had also offered help to persecuted Tutsis. There was a family my parents helped when their house was burned down. They lived on the other side of the river. They sheltered with all their belongings at our place in 1973. At that time, there weren't many deaths. Their surname was Amina Dabu. Rwandans today now recognize the actions of the righteous. At the Gisozi Memorial in the capital, where the remains of 250,000 Tutsis are buried, there is a room dedicated to them. A photo of Frodjuld and his story is exhibited there. But after the genocide ended, these saviors were not popular. In the eyes of many Hutus, they were traitors and were still not trusted by Tutsis. It took several years for Rwandan society to recognize them for what they were. I firmly believed that just about all Hutus had been executioners in one way or another, whether it was through the use of a machete or through denunciation. When we carried out this study, we realized there were a lot more selfless people than we had previously thought. Sometimes they ask me, my kids, why don't you have your father, your grandfather like others? We tell them it is because of the genocide. But if we stop there, but sometimes I tell them, okay, it was genocide, people, Hutus killed the Tutsi. Huh? By then it was a very bad policy, but there was a Hutu who saved me. That's why my life. Yes. And now, when you meet Josephine, what do you feel? I feel I'm meeting my saviors. Humanly, 
she's my savior. So you can consider yourself, you can feel it yourself. If you meet someone who saved your life, I feel high. The only thing you cannot replace is your mother. But I see Josephine as a mother, as a role model. She helped me. She gives me advice when I need it. It's given me confidence in myself. One of those I saved gave me a cow a very beautiful cow. And he said in front of everyone how good it is to pay people back who've been good to you. Nothing beats generosity. If someone is righteous, if they put others in front of themselves, Gisimba is one of the righteous. Now, when I think about what happened, I say to myself, I've honored my parents. Wherever they are, they're proud. This man, it's impossible to describe him as anything other than a hero. Everybody knew that if you got caught hiding somebody, you would be killed. But he ignored that. His heroism must be praised. He's the only person I know who sacrificed himself like that. When something is good, you have to talk about it. If you do that, those who listen will be able to follow that example and do the same thing. You have to talk about good deeds everywhere. And if I'm not sharing it, others will. Whether people appreciate what I did or not, the important thing is to talk about it. That's also why you have come here, to tell my story. And that was our report from Luc Lagan Boucher. And that brings us to the end of this edition of Reporters Plus. Remember, you can see this along with past episodes on our website, france24.com slash en. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time.